so that you have this really hard surface on the top and the magma can go through this tube and continue to make these really long pillow structures. It's kind of like uh, squeezing a tube of toothpaste. Yeah. And then after a while, the pressure builds up and so sort of busts out the front end. Exactly. I had a quick question about our uh, diving depth, but um, all of the information about how deep we are and um, the ROV capacities is on nautiluslive.org. Just scroll down, you'll see live data, and you can click on either one of the vehicles. Um, Hercules can go down to about 4,000 meters, and right now we're sitting at 2,547 meters. All right, zoom in, please. Oh, I see a really cool animal. We are going to take a look at it. This is an anthemastis. It's a type of soft coral. It's often called a mushroom coral because uh, when these polyps close up, uh, the top of the coral looks like the head of a mushroom. So it's like a little, little mushroom, kind of like from Mario, you might see. Okay, come on, please. Play, uh, play video games at all. Question for you. I saw there was eight legs or whatever you call them. Is this an octocoral? Yes, it is an octocoral. Okay. Gold star identity. We got to go. The way to identify uh, octocoral is by seeing that they have eight tentacles around the mouth. And then those uh, tentacles are also pinnate, meaning it has those sort of little <laughs> fringe around the edges of those tentacles. So it does, if it doesn't have the fringe, it's not an octagoral? Correct. And that's why an octopus is not an octagoral? Correct. Okay. <laughs> kind of like that a uh, rectangle, or a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square situation. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes eight is a magic number in the deep sea. You've got octopuses, octocorals. Six is also quite uh, a common magic number. Um, black corals, for example, have six tentacles. Um, our glass sponges, uh, the, the scientific name for glass sponges is hexactinellida. And so you hex, meaning six, um, the glass pieces that make up the skeletons of these um, sponges are have like six rays on them. So they're actually all really very interesting. Uh, these these pieces are known as spicules and the spicules um, have six sort of uh, spikes. I did not know that, that's mm -hmm. cool. And having uh, those sort of six spikes helps those pieces to stay together. So they sort of um, link together to make that structure of the sponge skeleton. And they all come in different sizes and sort of shapes. And in order to identify the sponges to species, uh, a taxonomist will actually take a small sample from the sponge, dissolve away any of the tissue, and look at the spicules. And the different uh, spicules will help that person to identify which species it is because every sponge has a unique array of spicules. Sponge question, are all ocean sponges stalked? No, not all ocean sponges are stalked. Um, there are very, uh, uh, quite a few that do have stalks and there are quite a few that don't. Um, we do see a lot more stalk sponges in the deep sea and we see a couple stock sponges in a bunch of different families. Um, so you have your euplectelid sponges that are on stocks, and those are our bolosoma uh, sponges that we saw earlier. And then you have uh, sponges in the family Rosellidae um, that are on stocks, and those are our caliphacus that we were spotting as well. And just to name a few stock sponges. 
And the benefit of the stalk is that it gets them higher up off the sea floor, is that it? Exactly. So higher up off the sea floor, uh, sponges are filter feeders, uh, and and they're passive filter feeders. So they basically wait for food to come to them, and the water will flow through the body of the sponge, and the animal will then be able to filter out any food it wants from that water. I would love to just wait for food to come to me, as long as it was abundant anyway. <laughs> Abundant, but you don't get a really a choice of what kind of food it is. True. But nowadays, uh, you can definitely make sure food comes to you. You know, ordering on uh, all those apps that we have these days. I refuse. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be an interesting concept for an app. It's, instead of calling it the same as the existing ones, you call it something to do with filter feeding. <laughs> you sit there and wait to the, for the food to come to you, but you don't get to pick what it is. It'd always be a surprise. Yeah. Actually, that might work. It would be pretty, like, high concept, I think. You could yeah. get people to buy into that. Make it, like, three times more expensive than the regular services. Yeah, you just, like, say what kind of uh, money you're willing to spend, and then someone just picks you up something. You it don't get to know when it's going to arrive, either. It just oh, arrives at right. random. Okay, so do corals have allergies? <laughs> I wouldn't know. My name is Coralie and I have allergies. <laughs> oh, okay, so then yes. <laughs> Sounds like an, an allergist, uh, allergetic anonymous meeting. <laughs> My name is Avery and I also have allergies. Thank you. Does every animal have allergies? Technically, I guess every animal has things that they shouldn't put in their body, right? So maybe. <laughs> oh, Argus fish. Look. What is that? Well, that's a cuskiel saw uh, in the Argus view. It definitely didn't want to hang out with us. No. That's probably the fastest I've ever seen one move. Yeah, someone commented that aren't we all waiting to be fed on EV Nautilus? And it is always something of a surprise. That is actually true. Although we do know exactly when the food will be here. So. Yeah, that's true. Almost all the way. Unfortunately, they do uh, allow free feeding. Uh, food is usually <laughs> uh, available. Uh, you don't really get to choose what's available, but there is always something to eat. So. No, we won't go hungry, which I really do appreciate. <laughs> do, do sponges have parasites? Um, yes, sponges um, do likely have some parasites. Uh, it also depends on uh, how you describe a parasite. Uh, a lot of times we see animals associating with sponges, but they're not necessarily um, parasitic on that sponge. They're sort of using the sponge's habitat, um, but almost every animal has another animal that is parasitic on them. Fortunately, including humans, so we try not to think about it too much. Yeah, try not to think about it too much. If we have a chance, can we take a look at one of these uh, Norella corals? Uh, any one of these little white ones that we're passing by? Sure. Make a make a dot on the telestrator anytime, and I'll do my best. All right. Pop this one right in the center. That one's perfect. Okay. 
Okay, go ahead and zoom, please. Oops, got a bit of momentum. Sorry. So this one looks like it's that Pleurogorgia, or uh, Romal Romiligorgia militaris. It used to be called Pleurogorgia militaris, uh, but it was recently renamed to Remulogorgia. So this is a coral in the family Chrysogorgidae. And the way to identify that coral yep. is um, all the polyps are lining up in a straight line along the branches of that coral, sort of in a military style. That's how I always remember that one. That's a mnemonic devices as well. Yeah, yeah, you gotta find little tricks uh, to help you remember the names of some of these organisms. Isn't that why that one was named that way? It might be, yeah. A lot of the names do have meaning. And then from a, a far view, I see a few more of that same species of coral. Uh, and I can recognize them because they have a slightly different color compared to the primnoid corals. So the Romilogorgia tends to look a little bluish in tint. Can we check out this guy? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a stocked crinoid, or um, it is a sea lily is the common name. Okay, zoom in, please. And this one has uh, five branches or five arms on it. So it's in the family Hyocrinidae. What's up with his top leg there? A little shorter. Yeah, it looks like maybe someone uh, nommed on that, yeah. that top arm uh, and those pinules have been broken away or, or something happened to it. I do believe they can regrow, so uh, they this, this individual will be okay. You got it, buddy. <laughs> Stick with it. Does anyone liken it to a palm tree? Because it looks very palm tree, tree to me. It does look like a palm tree. I also really love their color, that bright yellow. Yeah, not many people can pull off that color yellow. <laughs> now somebody commented that you got to be up on your Greek and Latin. You know, speaking English, we have pulled from all sorts of languages. So Greek and Latin is always helpful in all situations. You are all crinoids and stars symmetrical and multiple that size. One? Yep. Ah, come back. So this is a primnoid coral. And as we zoom in, there are a few associates. Seeing some brittle stars in the branches of this coral. And as we get a closer look, we might be able to see a little more detail on the polyps. And what I'm looking for here is uh, which direction these polyps are closing. Uh, when the polyps are closed, they'll either close in an upwards direction or a downwards direction. Oh. Looks like the ones that are closed over on the left-hand side are closing down, which leads me to believe that this individual is uh, Norella. And also, as we look at the polyps, you can see that has sort of a scaly texture. Norellas also have okay, come on. Uh, three layers of those scales along their polyp body wall. So that's another way to identify that genus. <coughs> oh, 
Someone was asking if all stars are symmetrical in multiples of five. Sounds good. So, um, echinoderms do have that um, pentagonal symmetry. So you're going to have that, that those symmetri symmetry in fives generally. Um, but that's not like a, a full rule where you have to have five arms. Um, the family that of that coral or that um, sea lily that we were looking at is uh, always has that five those five arms. We've got a new coral for us here. Yeah, let's have this a zoom really in on exciting. that, please. This is a uh, bubblegum coral. Has it been eaten? No, its polyps are closed. Oh. Yeah, so it's actually retracted its polyps. So this is a paragorgia. Why is it so white versus the pink normal bubblegum? Yeah, so normally when we see them, they're like bright red or pink, uh, but they do come in white. And that's not necessarily a character of a species. Uh, some species can range in color between white and red. Thank you. But usually when I annotate an animal like that, I, I do make a note of the coloration because it is interesting that um, that one is white. So now that we're getting a little bit shallower, we're seeing a few more species of coral. Now that we have the uh, paragorgias. We might see some hemichorallium as well. Coralie, one of our viewers is saying, it looks like we're seeing more manganese nodules in the sediment now. Is that what we're seeing? Yeah, so these are ferromanganese crusts. Nodules generally form on the seafloor. So there's a couple different ways you differentiate between the two, even though ferromanganese crusts and nodules have similar physiochemical properties. Uh, nodules will form around a sediment particle so they're easier, a little bit easier to extract, whereas ferromanganese crusts form on hard substrates. So that's why we see them along the ridges of seamounts. Now, can uh, nodules form anywhere, or they usually only form in sedimented areas? Generally, they form to form around the particle. They would it would be on the seafloor, like the abyssal plain. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Well, since we're on the topic of geology, um, we're in an area known as the prime crust zone. What makes this area of the ocean different than other areas in terms of uh, forming these ferromanganese crusts? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things that are known to aid in crust formation. So. One is that it's below the CCD, and the CCD is the calcite compensation depth. And that means below that, uh, calcite essentially starts to dissolve. Um, so, and you want sediment, it to be free of sediment, which helps aid in crust formation. And so, where there's no sediment, free of sedimentation, bottom currents that remove sediments also helps 
And then for really big, nice crust, you want, since they form so slowly, you want them to have form, be forming on substrate that's, you know, okay, thanks. really old. <laughs> like these seamounts. Very cool. And we just zoomed in on a Dictialis sponge. It is a sponge in the family Euplectelidae. Uh, that same group that I was saying had stock sponges, you see that that sponge was, was not stocked, but actually a vase shape. And a cool thing about those sponges is they have sort of a sieve plate over, over the top, and oftentimes you'll see some shrimps uh, that are living inside that sponge. Shrimp. So are they slowly being digested, or can they just no, hang out in there? They just hang out in there. Uh, it's their home. Um, they just really enjoy the studio apartment life, and they've committed to it. <laughs> How does that particular coral eat, then, if they're not eating what's inside of them? So the, the shrimps that live inside the sponge will be eating anything that's coming in through the sponge. Oh, true. And they just use the sponge as a home. And the sponge, I, I don't believe, gets any sort of benefit by having shrimps, but they could. Uh, like, the shrimps will consume anything or remove anything that gets, is too large, but that sieve plate usually helps uh, keep large things from entering the body of the sponge. Uh, I don't. I think this is a Megan question. How long after lava flows and pools do corals and sponges start to come back or appear on them? So that's a good question. Um, actually, my thesis research was actually looking at coral and sponge growth uh, on lava flows off the Big Island of Hawaii. So I was looking at how that coral community there actually grows and develops over time by comparing lava flows of different ages. Uh, the youngest lava flow that we surveyed was 65 years old, and that lava flow had uh, corals on it um, that were relatively small. And we understand the, um, the growth rate of that coral quite, quite well, um, and we would estimate that those corals we're between 30 and 60 years. So it doesn't take that long uh, for that cooling to be uh, enough that you might see coral sed settlement. Um, but it does need to be cool. Uh, it does take a long time in terms of, you know, months to really cool down. But after that, the, the substrate is viable for settlement. So we're somewhere in the, a little over halfway through this watch of the Lu'ua'ea Hiki Kei expedition. It's our first first dive of the expedition. It's going to last about 24-ish hours, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Right now we are climbing up the slope of unnamed Seamount C, which is near the Shotaka Seamount, which is just outside of the Papahana Mapuakea Marine National Sanctuary, Marine National Monument. Oh, let's definitely check out this coral. That looks a bit different. So I'm thinking this is a bamboo coral, but we'll get to see it a little bit closer and it'll become very obvious what kind of coral this is. Yep, this is definitely bamboo. a bamboo coral. And what we're looking at is where uh, this bamboo is branching and if it's branching at the nodes, so those black bands, or at the internodes. So it looks like it's branching just below the nodes, so that this is branching at the internodes. So we call this coral an internodal brancher. 
And if you're looking at an animal guide, you can look that up at the Corredo Isididae internodal. This colony seems to be pretty planar. Might be in the J3 clade. So a lot of these bamboo corals are still being described and uh, there are a couple groups working on the genetics of this group and they've been splitting them into clades. So these are sort of genetic groupings of um, corals within that family, Corradoicididae. To expand on what you were saying about um, new uh, sponges and coral life forming on lava flows, um, is there first a colonization of microbes or bacteria that come along before uh, coral succession can happen on new substrates, or can they just get right down to it? Um, well, that hasn't been very well studied, especially not in the deep sea. Uh, if I were to guess, I. I would think that it would take some time uh, before corals can settle just because of uh, the way the rock is. So it's, it's silicious in nature, so they got that sort of fine layer of glass right when it's formed. Um, settling directly on that wouldn't be easy for an animal to do. Uh, so maybe some time before they can settle directly on it. Um, but other than that, I don't think there's anything really deterring them from settling. Uh, and they might not necessarily need a microbial uh, community to start growing. Um, yes, someone is asking if uh, this expedition is time-based, uh, regardless of if the goal is reached. No, we are, um, we are taking our time. We are exploring, um, picking up geological biological samples, so this is a bit more open-ended. We're just going to explore. Yeah, and the interesting thing about our exploration during this dive is we are actually creating a transect of the side of this seamount, um, going from our greatest depth of uh, 3,900 meters and then all the way to the summit. So that's going to show us sort of a nice slice of what the community is like uh, from very deep to as shallow as we can get uh, and, and really understand how that community changes with depth. Even within uh, the last four hours, we've definitely seen a quite big change in um, the community. Uh, when we first got here, it was pretty sparse, not a lot of animals, uh, but recently we've been seeing quite a few sponges and corals. We're also taking rock samples at regular intervals. What's uh, the significance of taking rock samples from different depths along the seamount? Yeah, so we're hoping to get a um, to sa sample different oxygen concentrations because we know that at least for some of the metals, there's a um, there's a correlation or sometimes an anti-correlation or a negative correlation between the amount of oxygen and the how much of a metal is in the crust. So for example, the less oxygen you have, the more cobalt is in the crust. Want to zoom on that guy? Yes, please. Okie doke. Yeah, this one looks like a little bit different, a little bit finer branching. So I want to take a nice quick look at it. Okay, zoom in when ready, please. Yeah, doing zooms like this is really helpful uh, when someone like myself is going to go and, and annotate the video just to get an idea of, of what's here. Is that a nodal some, brancher? This is actually a primnoid oh, coral, rats. so it doesn't have um, any sort of 
branch. Okay, come wide, please. I gotta go. And oftentimes we have a, a lot of associates. So when we were zooming in on that coral, I saw a mycid shrimp or an opossum shrimp. Um, they're not true shrimps, uh, but they are pretty cute and small. And we often see them associated uh, with some of these corals. They're called a right, possum shrimp because they have a brood pouch where they keep <clears> their <throat> eggs. Got some love from the crowd uh, for the telestrator. I too love the telestrators. I know, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, oh, is the telestrator streamed to shore? Yeah. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to describe exactly where you want to zoom. So, this is like a really great tool. So, I just feel like it's the pink thing on the lower right left corner. <laughs> I love the lower right left corner. Exactly. <laughs> of the ocean. <laughs> Lower right, left corner of the ocean. Hmm. Well. I have a question. Do we ever run across meteoroids, hole or otherwise, sitting on the bottom? He actually, yeah. I was on a, a, a Falcor cruise, and the Nautilus uh, did the same expedition as well, looking for um, meteorites on the sea floor. They do usually melt away into... Um, very, very small uh, particles, um, usually under a centimeter, but um, they're more the kind of thing where you have to pick up some sediment and then examine the sediment. Um, on that expedition, we were looking for chunkier uh, specimens that we did not. Uh, well, actually, I don't know the results of ours. Another still. four zero meters, two seven five. Um, so the, the, we, the, it's not impossible to find a meteorite, but they're usually pretty small. I've got a joke for you. Oh, no. So uh, if a meteorite is a rock that lands on a planet, what do you call a meteor that misses a planet? Oh, clearly it's a meteor Love wrong. Okay, all good. Uh, question, did we just run a big magnet along the arms of the ROV to get the meteorites? I wish. No. Um, we were literally scooped. Well, at least on the Falcor. You guys can answer for the Nautilus. But um, we were using, I think we decided to call it the Cosmic Sieve. It looked like an upside-down cheese grater. We were scooping up sediment and literally shaking it to see if there were any chunky rocks in there. And then we were taking slush and analyzing it later in the, in the wet lab. On our last meteorite attempt, we had the like a, a wire mesh over where the sediment would come out when we suction it, and the wire mesh was lined in magnets to try and catch really small particles, but that was meteorite attempt number two. I think that was last year. Got some questions about the Telestrator. It's actually relatively new, I believe. Um, so, and I know that it's not used on by every single uh, lead, so that might be why you don't always see it. But I think it's the coolest thing ever. It's a recent upgrade from our stick of science, pointing stick of science. We had a little. We still have the stick of science. We still have the stick of science. Here, we'll demonstrate. Critical spare. Science stick. Works Focus like so. 
plastic stick with a little rubber nubbin on the end so we don't scratch the screens. It was slightly less elegant, but very reliable. In the past, we've used some uh, laser pointers to try to point things out. And some lasers are very bright. Uh, the Telestrator is definitely an upgrade. Bridge nav, another four zero meters, two seven five. Oh, I'm trying to get the number. Just back here looking at some data. Um, on, let's see, on average, how many dives do we do per trip from port? Depends on the expedition. I think we have something like five or six dives planned, but it also depends on you know weather conditions. Things might change mid dive, so things change around. We've got some questions uh, on the meteorite subject. Um, Coralie, this is probably for you. You know, if we just stuck some heavy magnets on the ROVs, would we pick up, or like, would we pick up a lot of average rocks, or would we get mostly meteorites? Like, how many average rocks are uh, would be magnetic? Uh, I think it would be hard. Well, so what makes you able to pick up them is that there's minerals that are magnetic. So one. For example, is magnetite, and you can find those in volcanic rocks. But since they're composed, it compo it's what composes the ocean crust. They're pretty stuck on. I don't think you'd be able to successfully pick up a rock unless it was, you know, broken up and small. Actually, if you're in your home, in your dwelling, in your neighborhood, and you want to go meteorite hunting, you can. If you just um, get a large flat uh, magnet. Have another four zero meters two seven five. 
and to kind of go like a, what is it called um, when you do like the metal detecting except you're you're just like waving this magnet around and then you have a, a magnifying glass you'd be surprised at how many micrometeorites you'll actually pick up you can get those little wheeled magnet rakes from a hardware or automotive store they're used for cleaning up construction sites and getting all the screws and nails and stuff off the ground just grab one of those and walk it like a dog around in your backyard and then actually that will answer your question because you will get a lot of things that are not meteorites um, but you'll get some micrometeorites in there somewhere Yes, and one of the commenters said, except in Hawaii where you pick up lots of lava rocks too. Yes, that's that's the issue. There are more more magnetic things than meteorites out there. Just to quickly answer one of the questions that we got, um, we're sitting around 20% of the ocean uh, mapped at a high resolution. Fish, fish, fish. What are you backwards swimming? Yeah. You can zoom if you'd like on this backwards swimming fish. <laughs> Excuse me, can you face me, please? Nope. Hello, please play along. a good size. Not a bad size, that's for sure. Let's see if I can paint it with the lasers here. Oh, not quite. Too skinny. <laughs> All right, let's see. So I got a couple of seconds here. I hope so. Yeah, everyone also got the hint. That's fine, I'll just follow this fish. Do we have Kelly back there? Surprise. What are you doing? Um, Abrian has a, an interaction with Allison at eight, so I am letting her go eat breakfast. Very good. <laughs> Getting my 30 minutes of SBL time. Well, hello. Nice. <laughs> Figured I'd sneak in and surprise everyone. Surprise. <laughs> Rich Nav, another four zero meters, 275.
Big rock. Why is this lumpy rock here? Who left that here? Hmm? Yeah, I could probably sample that. Whoa! <laughs> Let's look at the thing that's circled. Can you zoom in, please? It's going to be far, but we'll see what happens. Well... It's a white octocoral, and that's where I'm out. <laughs> Neat. Okay. Thanks. Oh, bottom of the screen, you're making it tough for me. Or else I got no, no voice. Just Have you found any yet of the ones that you're interested in? No talking. I don't know. Whoever's talking doesn't know they're on a, not on SPL. If you, yeah, we, we can't hear you if you want us to hear you. No. Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, zoom in on that, please. That. I were to talk about that sea cucumber. This is the pinkest cucumbus. <laughs> I don't know. Unless Science Row wants to talk about it, I will keep speculating wildly. Oh no. Oh. oh. It's oh. the gotta go as see you later us. Goodbye. All right, bye. Thanks. <laughs> what was that? You're do not wanna, on SPL. Do you want to talk on SPL? Oh, sorry. I must have switched it off for a second. You've um, been off for a while, I think. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. We haven't heard you for a bit. There's just oh. been mystery circles appearing there. Like, do you want to zoom? I'll just Oh, go yeah. For it. I guess I was just talking to myself. <laughs> My goodness. Um, yeah, so that sea cucumber um, is in the Cynolactida, and it is likely uh, a Paleopatites. And so those are usually our, our purple sea cucumbers that are very cucumber looking. Paleo potatoes. Yeah, whatever whatever that you said. <laughs> I could go for some potatoes. Yeah. It sounds like breakfast. Potato Tater dots. Bridge nav, another four zero meters, two seven five. Hmm. I guess I was not watching deck cam because I learned it was daytime because that's blue. <laughs> Usually that's my giveaway, but I was like, oh, it must be daytime. I, I had a similar experience. I'm like, I wonder what it's like outside. Where would I look for that information? Oh, oh the DP screen. <laughs> There's, yeah, and that, when she turned that up, I was like, holy cow. Oh, wow. Well, there it is. Good morning. <laughs> for any viewers who are curious, uh, if you go to the quad cam or uh, the third video, it's just changed over. and You can watch the sunrise. It came up about 20 minutes ago. 
Or from the front row, you can watch the DP screen change from <laughs> night mode to day mode. Yes. <laughs> it's still nighttime at 2,300 meters. Got a few birds hitching a ride. That's quite a few birds. Birds. Six. Yeah. Well, and they're sharing. How I think nice we're of on them. A position excursion. That's all we like to share. Yeah. <laughs> my favorite it's normal i feel like when you're just flying <laughs> around though for so What's long it must be so nice to just like rest so, for yeah, a little land somewhere they do like to follow us in the ship mm -hmm. and they'll stick with us for most of our journey there was a big thing on that rock and now it is no longer oh yeah the big old base spot yeah, that was probably a hold fast for a sponge. Megan, we have a question come in uh, asking, do you find larger communities on older seamounts? I'm assuming larger communities of sponges and corals on older seamounts in the Hawaiian line of messy mounts or are younger seamounts where the party is? Is what <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Quoting the question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, actually, I don't think uh, age of the seamount really is impacting the density of the community here. Uh, just because geologically something might be young, biologically it's still really old. Um, when you're going to really see that difference is when you're looking in the, the hundreds and thousands of years old um, substrate versus, you know, here this is millions of years old. You're not going to see a, a big difference in the community. But you might see uh, some of that ancient, uh, old holdfasts like we just spotted on some of the rocks. So you do see some of the past life that's gone through the iterations of growth and death and, and regrowth. So it's kind of interesting um, to be able to see a little bit of that history uh, in shallower water where you might have uh, old coral reef growth. Um, you can see those sort of uh, ancient um, corals or paleo corals uh, as evidence of a longer lived area. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like high density communities, you can see high density communities on a substrate that's only a couple thousand years old. Are you um, squirreling stuff? And also see high density communities on a substrate that's millions of years old. The difference might be um, between something that's only a thousand years old and millions of years old is uh, maybe the animals that are, are making up that community. And, and a lot of work still needs to be done in that area. So only a few studies have been done studying how a community in the deep sea might change over time. Mm. And it's really challenging to, to study that just because of how slowly these communities form and grow over time. So we have to find different ways to understand how the community might change by by using proxies like substrate age. Coralie, over the course of the night, have you gotten any of your sample rocks? Yeah, we have, it looks like four samples for me what's the number for this expedition that you're hoping i was to hoping get? to get six per dive okay we have actually we have five rocks and we have four water samples awesome
Oh, there's another really cool vase sponge off to the right. That one, if we look straight down into it, might have some of those shrimps living in it. And if not, we do have a nice red shrimp swimming by. <laughs> oh. oh, that looks cool. Yeah, I think I can see one in there. Yeah, they usually have a pair of shrimp in there. They're a mated pair. So this is a Regadrella um, glass sponge, and inside are shrimps in the genus Spongicola. So why was that shrimp white? Um, they're just white. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> shrimp colors. I've never seen a white shrimp, I don't think. Yeah, the ones that live in the sponges are white. Um, okay. A lot of the deep sea shrimps are red. Um, I feel like I've seen a red shrimp in a sponge, though, too, haven't I? There's a fish. Oh, probably. Oh, I gotta go. Goes. I'm falling way behind. Yeah, being red in the deep sea can be quite a good advantage. Oh, we got a fish coming up. Another fish, but I gotta go. Bye. Bye, fish. Bye, fish. Bye, fish. <laughs> There's another cusk eel swimming by. As we've gotten shallower, it's definitely gotten a little fishier. Mm. Seeing a few more fish, a lot more coral. This range in like between 2,000 and, and 2,500 meters tends to be a, quite a good community of animals. What was it? Thanks. All right, I'm caught up again. Oh, can we take a look at this? Uh, this brown oh, one, or are we oh, going too fast? I'll make it work. It yeah. might be bouncy. Go ahead. Yeah, I believe that's a black coral. Oh, not that one. The oh. brown one that was just below it. Down one. <laughs> oh, this one. Yeah. That one yeah, looks more that like one. a black coral. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yep, this is a black coral. It's likely uh, Trispathes. You'll notice a lot of the black corals uh, have the pathies okay, at the end thanks. of the name. Why is that? So the black corals are in the order Antipatheria, which means against disease. Um, they are believed to be medicine or be able to be used as medicine. Oh, Scott France, that's one of Scott France's uh, little... things that he says. He is writing to us in the chance, uh, in the chat. We have a former SCF, Brian Soash, who sailed with us in 2018. Uh, his class is joining and uh, is wondering a bit more about the location that we're at. Do you mind talking a bit about where we are and you know why this is pretty unique that we're here and why no one else has come here? Yeah, so this seamount chain it lies just outside the boundaries of the Papahānaumokuākea Marine National Monument, not very far away from the main Hawaiian islands. Um, and we haven't really targeted this area for research before because these these seamounts aren't within um, those uh, Northwest Hawaiian islands. Um, and it's recently that we've had the technology